thanks everybody uh, for joining us and for your interest in Google Workspace design. Uh, before we jump uh, into the slides, uh, a, a couple of uh, uh, thoughts on how we go about this. Uh, so Hayden and I uh, will present and take you through the presentation. And then uh, later on, we have two colleagues uh, who will join us uh, for the Q&A section. What are we going to talk about today? We thought, obviously, talking to a startup uh, audience, it would be nice to look back and see uh, where did we start 15 years ago? What did Google look like uh, 15, 14 years ago? Uh, so a, a quick uh, glimpse at the early days, actually. And then <clears throat> we want to uh, look at the question of does space matter and how do we design, actually, uh, with data? Uh, to figure out what matters and what doesn't. How do we make design decisions at Google? And then we want to share some ideas about workspace design with you. Uh, we'll show you a lot of pictures, but we don't just show you fancy pictures. We want to show you and talk about the thought process behind the design decisions that uh, led to these spaces. And we hope that uh, that might give you some ideas uh, that uh, might be helpful for you when, when you think about your own space design. And then after that, we'll open it up uh, for Q&A. So uh, my name is Ralph Klöckner. I'm responsible for real estate and workplace services analytics at Google. We also have Hayden Perkin here who will uh, talk us through uh, part of the presentation. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we have Laura Gimple who has a ton of experience uh, with Google from the beginning, really took small offices and turned them into thousands of people offices and knows hands-on what it takes to do that. And we have Kasper Wagner here. He is uh, with our green team, and he's an expert on uh, green design and sustainability. So if you have questions, uh, keep them down uh, and uh, send them, uh, submit them, so that we can uh, later draw on uh, those experts and answer them. What's uh, Google all about? What's our goals? And I thought this photo with uh, two happy, healthy, and productive Googlers uh, uh, shows you what we're after, really. It's, it's, it's really about that. It's uh, making Google a place where people can be happy, healthy, and productive. And so uh, the question is, how do you do that, right? And uh, let's have a look at the early days, how it all started. I really like uh, this picture, and maybe some of you uh, can relate to, uh, to that. This is actually in our third office already in a very short period of time. We moved a, a bunch of times. But what you see here is actually uh, the first desks at Google. And the founders uh, didn't want to spend too much money, so they got pine doors, cut them up, and put them on sawhorses. And uh, that was an affordable way to make space for people to work, you know. And it's a scrappy attitude that uh, was, back, uh, was alive back then, and it's still alive with a lot of the things we do uh, today. And once we show you some of what Google looks like today, we point out a few of these uh, things because it might not be uh, obvious to you. Uh, need a meeting room? Well, you pop up a screen, you fire up the overhead projector, uh, it's it's kind of amazing after 15 years how foreign this technology looks today, but uh, you, you probably find it in a museum now. But that's what it looked like, right? And there was no formal meeting space. You just popped it up where you needed it. And uh, actually, the dog in the foreground, also a testament to our culture. Uh, dogs were welcome back then at Google, and uh, they actually still are. I hope the contrast is good enough for you to see this, but uh, this is an early TGIF, and if you can't see it very well, it was a TGIF is when the whole company comes together and Larry and Sergey talk about what happened uh, over the last week. And it's uh, really a testament to Google's culture. It's super open communication, and it's also something that has carried over. Now, this space is super crowded. You do see that uh, actually uh, even today uh, in TGIFs, but uh, the ergonomic situation for the speakers have improved a little. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, the speakers are standing on some chairs here so people can see them. This was in the office space. Other people stand on their desks to, to watch them. That has improved. But the culture of uh, coming together over like beer and pizza and talking very openly is still there. You know? And you see that also permeate into how we design spaces. This is one of our first cafes, actually, Charlie's. And uh, you hear a lot of people talk about Google's perks, and uh, they're certainly awesome. 
and, uh, but sometimes people criticize and say maybe they're a little lavish. Uh, but if you look at how it started and how it's still done today, there's a purpose for those. So the first cafe and the free food came about when Google moved to Mountain View and everyone had to hop in their car over lunchtime and, and drive into Mountain View to get, uh, to get something to eat and it was very inefficient. So the founders wanted a more efficient way to feed people and they brought a cafe on. And the way they went about it is also a testament to Google's culture. They didn't just decide, let's uh, take this chef and open it up. They had like uh, a bunch of chefs cook for Googlers and then Googlers decided whom they wanted to uh, have cooking for them. So this involvement of the user uh, of the Googlers, uh, another cultural thing that was there early on and you'll still see that uh, was many things that, that we do today. As a matter of fact, we just had a micro kitchen fair uh, where we brought a lot of vendors and Googlers could vote on what they want to see in their micro kitchens. Well, uh, early affordable rejuvenation spaces and uh, you may recognize that gentleman, one of our founders. So uh, we have still a lot of those around and so in, in, in the startup phase obviously you can't build all these uh, big spaces uh, to support uh, rejuvenation or uh, gyms and exercise spaces, but that shouldn't prevent you from having fun. Uh, like uh, the team back then got some hockey gear and went out on the parking lot and had their movement and exercise and, and play, right? So, you know, uh, don't, don't look at the fancy things and, and despair. Look at how it started and just be flexible and work with what you got. And so if I look at the, uh, the, the learnings from these early days, I would say it's a journey, you know, but a lot of what uh, drives our design decisions today from a cultural perspective uh, was already there back then. It was like a, a vision of what Google should be that the founders and the early Googlers had. And, and uh, that translates into design decisions even today. Work with what you've got, be scrappy, have fun, and actually maybe, uh, maybe you uh, become a cat company so there's some equality because Google definitely uh, likes dogs and there's uh, no cats allowed in the offices. We actually have a, a policy in our employee handbook on that, which is kind of funny. Okay, uh, does space matter? When you guys look at space, uh, what do you think? Do you think cost? I mean, space typically is uh, one of the biggest cost drivers of uh, a company, right, next to uh, compensation for employees. Uh, do you think about like the, the hassle it is to plan ahead and, and make sure you have the space available on time, especially in the early days? It's probably hard to plan, right? But there's another angle I want you to, to think of uh, when you look at space, and that's really what does it do to human performance? What does it, does it do to your people? And so I want to talk uh, you a little bit through like the metrics that we're looking at and how we uh, make uh, decisions that are driven by data. It really starts with, with your business outcomes. What are you trying to accomplish? Revenues, if you're a public total shareholder return, and there's probably a number of others that you're after. And so if you ask yourself, uh, what drives those? There's things like productivity, effectiveness, quality, velocity. Again, probably a few others uh, that, that might be relevant, but these are things that typically have an impact on if you're making money or not as a company, right? So if you then look at how do you um, impact these things like productivity, velocity through your people. It's things like are you able to attract the right talent? Are you able to retain them? Are you able to motivate them? And do you give them a work environment that is actually allowing them to be productive? And then there's a lot of research uh, out there typically done by HR that looks at like what engages people. You may have seen some of that. So it's the work you do, it's if you have career opportunities, it's your compensation, all these things. But, and, and that's all very important, and these are big drivers, but there's others. And more forward-looking companies uh, include things like well-being. Uh, so it's kind of obvious if you look at it, if your people don't feel well, if, if they're not healthy, they can't be productive. Uh, there's things like the physical work environment and how does that impact uh, productivity. And I highlighted in, in, in yellow some of these other people drivers that are probably impacted by the physical work environment like the brand that you give yourself. The physical work environment can be uh, a, a very visible way of, of displaying your brand, uh, the culture you want to build. I wouldn't use the physical work environment to create a culture that's not there, but I would use it to reinforce the culture that you want to have. And so if a very open culture is what you live in your management decisions, then uh, reinforce it with an open office environment. If that's not what your management decisions look like, don't think you can uh, create that management culture just by putting 
uh, an open workspace uh, in place that would probably get you in hot water. It's uh, things like well-being, and we'll uh, sh uh, show you some uh, slides on how we, how we uh, design spaces to uh, have people to rejuvenate and relax. And it's a resource for people. It's if you have an environment where you can sit down and be productive, uh, that Im impacts uh, your productivity. And we talk a, a lot of, uh, about a lot of the things that might get in the way of that and how we deal with that. So to measure how do you actually uh, know uh, if you're successful on these metrics, you need to measure. And uh, part of that is you need to measure the user experience. And uh, a lot of times people do surveys, and we do that too at Google. As a matter of fact, we just completed a very big one across our entire portfolio of buildings. But a survey doesn't always tell you the full story. You want to look at your places, and you want to talk to people, interview them, have focus groups, and also do observations. Sometimes in a survey, things look good. And then if you look at a space, you realize, ooh, uh, this is like totally different than what we intended, what's happening, and what users do with that space. So there's a mix of methods you want to employ to really see if, if your workspace works. And we go at uh, great lengths in this, actually. We ask uh, our people, for example, uh, about availability of meeting rooms or their experience in spaces. And then we actually look at ratios in buildings to see what's the ratio of small meeting rooms or what's like the type of floor cover or the acoustic ceiling tile in a building to get our arms around noise. So it's pretty detailed, but then it leads to uh, to decisions that actually can go all the way up and impact your productivity and ultimately your business outcomes. Another uh, key approach that we have is don't try and solve everything to the point that you're absolutely sure and then roll it out for your entire company. If you're small, that's uh, viable, but if you're a large company, uh, you don't want to do that. You want to stay quick and nimble as you are as a startup. And uh, so a lot of times what we do is do experiments on pilots, test something in a small group, maybe on a floor, doesn't work, uh, iterate, test it again, and once we feel good about it, we'll try and scale. So don't be afraid to uh, start small, test things, and then uh, roll things out. Okay, uh, let's look at uh, our workplaces today. And what we want to do is share some ideas about workspace uh, design with you. Uh, that, that we found uh, are helpful for us. You might use different ones that uh, work with your culture, uh, but we'll talk about the ones that, uh, that work for us. But authenticity is very important. So don't try and just copy what somebody else is doing, Google or some other company. Be true to your own brand and your own values that you want to implement. Um, also look at like, what's your employee audience? What are their expectations? We are talking about attract, retain, right? Understand uh, like your employees and what they're looking for. <clears throat> look at the type of work that you do uh, that might impact uh, how you design a space. Uh, engineers work different from sales, so you need to look at these things. Um, look at your growth expectations. When you, when, once you try and start plan ahead, if you're in a space and you know three months later you're running out of space and you move somewhere else, there's probably different things you do to that space than if you know that you're in that space for a couple of years. So try, try and keep that in, in mind, and that also alludes to the economics uh, of the deal. Look at what you can do as a company, but also look at what makes sense uh, for a specific space that you move into. Now, the principles that we try and follow is the Google experience first. So how do people experience and live in these spaces that we create? That's critical. Uh, a second very important point is health and well-being, and that was something that was important for, for the founders from the beginning, and it's an important part of our culture. And I showed you some of the fun pictures in the beginning with the hammock and, and playing uh, around. Uh, but there is a true belief uh, that they want Googlers to be uh, healthy, uh, and uh, there's a lot of effort put into that. Uh, we have healthy lifestyle managers that work on, on research. We try and uh, work on it by providing uh, services that uh, 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 try to, to drive healthy behavior, but we also reinforce it through spaces that we put in place. So we'll show that to you. And then sustainability. We believe that we have a responsibility for the environment. And so designing green is very important for us. And that has many facets. And we'll talk a little bit about what that exactly means. So let's look at the Google experience. And I don't drain this slide because we will uh, get to all of these points. Uh, uh, with some slides that show you how we actually implement them. The first one is have functional spaces. 
And there's obviously a million ways you can look at space and, and look at facets that make it functional or not. So we can only focus on a few here, but I want to give you some examples. And one I pulled is one that's uh, in the discussion a lot, and that's also at the forefront of what we have to think at Google. And that's like the whole question of open space, closed space, noise, ability to do concentrated heads down work versus rapid information exchange. There's a tension there that we have people that complain that their spaces are too noisy. And a lot of our spaces, I mentioned that we have a very open culture, a lot of our spaces are actually open. So what's, what's the response to that? Should that mean, okay, let's uh, make everything closed? Uh, probably not, you know, because there's research that shows that in open spaces you have more uh, collaboration and people tend to be uh, more productive. There's some interesting studies that, that were done externally on engineers where uh, people looked at like what does the uh, amount and quality of the code look like that they produce and it was better in an open environment because you can have that rapid interaction, ask a quick question, but there's also like nonverbal cues where you see what somebody is working on, you don't want to disturb them. So that's very interesting. So for us what we do is uh, we don't just say let's make everything enclosed, we say are there spaces in our global portfolio that seem to work that are open? And I mentioned that survey we just did and yeah indeed some of our spaces that work best for concentrated heads down work are open spaces. So what we're doing right now is diving in and trying to understand what is it that makes those spaces successful and it makes some other spaces that we have uh, less successful. And then hopefully we can take those insights and translate them and, and make uh, all these spaces uh, work better for people. So you see a lot of it, again, data-driven uh, design that is really aimed at making the, the spaces work for people. Uh, another example, quick example, you know, efficiency. This is uh, an indoor bike pass we have in one of our offices. In many of our offices, you see people scoot around on scooters. It's, it's kind of fun and it's functional. You know, it gets people where they need to go. It gets them to move a little bit, makes it fun. Uh, and uh, just an example of uh, easy things you can do. But uh, Google is trying a lot of things. Google is experimenting with a lot of things and not everything succeeds, right? So this is an example of uh, fun, but less functional. These are like actually Antarctic expedition igloos. And when they were decommissioned, Google was able to purchase them cheap and they're sitting in our Zurich office. And uh, I mean, they're awesome, right? And <clears throat> they're in a lot of books and, and got press coverage, which is great. Uh, so uh, talk about that part, mission accomplished. But when we started looking at uh, how Google has used spaces, we realized no one is actually using them. And that you only see through observation. And we wondered, why the heck is that? I mean, these are kind of cool spaces. And they're not so cool if you sit inside. They were like stuffy with the air inside. And so people went and looked at other spaces. And so knowing that we could go in and fix that and, uh, and deal with it. But that's the important part that I said in a survey that doesn't necessarily come out. You need to actually look and see what's going on in your space. Another important design concept is creating neighborhoods. And what do we mean by that? Um, again, we're data driven and a lot of the research shows that uh, collaboration is important for productivity and innovation. But it also shows that collaboration and communication breaks down fairly quickly when you look at proximity. So uh, there's some external research that talks about like 150 feet. You probably find some other numbers out there. For us, when we looked at it, we saw it makes a big difference if people can see each other and probably like in a, in a similar distance that starts to break down. So the, the key message is if you have people that you want to work together, put them in close proximity, arrange teams in a way that they can see each other and work with each other. And uh, you have a big drop, like it doesn't matter so much if somebody sits on the next floor, or if they sit in another building or in another location. It's the communication drops once that immediate uh, proximity is lost. So that's an important thing that we look at when we plan uh, spaces and we design those uh, around these uh, open neighborhoods. And then what's important from an efficiency perspective is to put support uh, infrastructure around those neighborhoods, like open uh, meeting places uh, for informal meetings, enclosed meeting rooms uh, where people can meet, uh, so that they don't have to walk too far to get to these places. Again, make it efficient for that neighborhood. We also create what we call like magnets. You may have heard of our micro kitchens where you can get uh, food and just hang out with people. 
And they're great to bring people from different neighborhoods together and have these uh, unplanned interactions and collaboration, which we believe is very important because a lot of times ideas don't necessarily just emerge in planned meetings. They come when people bump into each other and start talking. And we have, uh, and food is a good way to draw people. It's also a good way for us to uh, ensure the health uh, aspect of it, serve healthy foods. And there's very uh, different ways these micro kitchens look. You saw the first one uh, in Dublin, uh, very different feel uh, from this micro kitchen here. But the key point is, you know, you get people together, uh, interact, and good things will happen. With that, I'll turn it over to Hayden uh, to talk us through a few other aspects of our design. Great. I'm not just going to sit up here and look pretty. I'm also going to speak. Um, so thanks, Ralph. Sure. So just going through uh, uh, some more aspects of our workspace and ideas that we have around space. Um, w images we're showing right now are an experiment we did in the New York office, which I was involved in, which was a lot of fun. Um, so what we found, um, what works well in the work point, the desk at Google is flexibility. So we want to allow people to have choice and diversity in how they want to set up their desk. So typically, the desk at Google is a freestanding desk that staff can orientate. It's a pretty simple uh, 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 configuration with a mobile pedestal, which can be pulled out and provide a, a, a place for people to sit. What we did in New York was actually push things a little further and created with a furniture vendor an entire system that our Googlers could actually put together to create their own layout. So what we're actually seeing here is posts and beams with these universal connectors that allow people to create very built-up enclosed environments or very open environments to create teaming areas or individual areas. So the, uh, the creativity that people have is, is, is quite astounding. So on day one, we, we set it up pretty generically in these long rows. Uh, and what we learned is that we probably uh, shouldn't have done that because people freaked out when they looked at it. They didn't uh, realize that, wait, this looks like a call center. Um, but it, within a couple of hours, it's, it's clear that people saw the opportunity here. So on the right-hand side, we see people actually collaborating, teams coming together to talk about space, to talk about how they work, and then design their environment. So something to think about as you're setting up your own spaces is, you know, not necessarily prescribing what the solution is, but providing flexibility in your furniture and, and what you select so that your staff can arrange things in a way that allows them to be productive. And the other thing about the flexibility here is that as your needs change over time, you can reconfigure the furniture. Now we've moved these people, I've moved these people probably around six times since we, uh, since we moved into this space. So we're always moving Googlers around, um, always moving people around. So people can reconfigure their space to match their needs and as their teams change as well. Um, so the diversity and the flexibility around the work point also extends to other spaces. So when, uh, Ralph was talking about the neighborhood uh, earlier, um, a key part of uh, the concept there is providing spaces nearby that allow people to do the activities that are part of our overall work function in a day. So informal collaborative spaces, heads down work, uh, taking a call, taking a video conference, allowing um, spaces to be right next to the neighborhood so people can jump on a call, jump in a meeting very quickly. It's all about supporting how people work. Uh, another concept that we have um, kind of evolved over time and more recently talk about is this idea of removing, reducing friction um, from Googler's lives. So what we want to do in, in Workplace and, and, and Googler Services is think about um, the, the entire experience of, of a Googler as they, they leave their house in the morning and they, they go to work and they, they get things done. We want to kind of reduce the, the, the time wasted and, and in, in, increase, the, uh, increase the effectiveness. So an example we have here is actually what we call a tech stop. Um, you might wonder what that is. Basically what it is is if you have uh, a bit, bit of technology that, that's broken or not working or you need to install something new, you basically take this to a physical bar that's located in, in all, each office and a very smart um, uh, IT guy will sort you out very quickly. Um, and so the idea here is that, yeah, there are many ways of doing this, but we want to remove technology problems from being a barrier um, to people's everyday lives. So 
quickly, go and sort out your, your technology solution. Uh, there's also um, uh, displays where people can go and pick up a power cord. You just sort of badge in, you take the power cord. So it's removing that layer of having to have manager approval and, and go to, to, to the store and buy those items. Why not just, just provide it to people? Um, so we're talking a little bit before about different types of spaces. The sort of space that we're in today is about formal information sharing. So we have very regular um, sessions where we, we talk amongst ourselves inside Google and then bring external people into the company in order to get kind of the, the good stuff out, out of their brains as well. Um, uh, mentioned a little bit earlier is this idea that uh, heads down work and focus work can happen in a variety of spaces, and we do have support for that. Um, people either, you know, use headphones in their open work plan environment. There are some enclosed spaces as well for folks, and then we we, we have people going to uh, spaces as well, rooms to be able to go and, and do some focus heads down work for a period of time. Um, huddle rooms. Uh, these allow people to uh, usually non-bookable spaces allow people to kind of grab grab someone really quick and, and go and have a, a conversation without kind of having to book a space. And a big part of many of the photos that you may, may have seen and, and the fun things that you see um, when you visit the Google offices around the informal collaborative spaces. So you might see our two guys kind of uh, having a chat, playing some video games. I think there's an there's a, uh, Xbox and a, and a PlayStation 3 there. Um, these spaces are fun and they're about rejuvenation, but they're also about work. So often people are going uh, to these environments and connecting with other folks from a different business unit. And it's another uh, one of these attractor hub spaces that connects people from different floors, different business units, and allows them to collaborate. Um, so we do have some wacky spaces um, at Google, um, but they're, they're always with an eye to functionality, making sure that wherever there is a wall, we, we're usually optimizing with a whiteboard or some sort of writable surface. And it's not just to look pretty off, you know, it's, it's usually somebody working something out on them and, 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 and coding and all sorts of languages that I don't understand. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the sort of um, quiet work people are able to do, this is uh, one of our spaces in, in London. And the idea is creating a, a, an, um, a, an actual, a, a large sort of co-working room where the basic rule is don't make a noise, uh, don't be on a, a phone call, and, and don't uh, have conversations. And what we find is people go here to do um, a focus heads down work, but in a collaborative co-working setting. One of the things that we, 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 we've learned over time and we continue to learn is making sure that we get adjacencies right, making sure that one space type works next to the other. And we've certainly made um, a, a few areas there. So you look at this photo and, and you, you see, well, that looks nice. Uh, that's a nice Google office. Um, but we've made learnings over time. So what we're seeing here is an open, a, informal, collaborative area right next to the workstation. And the reality is that the noise generated here from people uh, uh, collaborating can be a little bit distracting for people who are in the work environment nearby. So what we think is, is a little bit more successful is when we co-locate activities. So thinking about what people are doing in the spaces and then sectioning off, creating an environment where people can go to this space um, and uh, collaborate together. This is all about informal collaboration um, and so it's a, separated from the, 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 the desking area so that we, we create some um, adjacencies. Um, we had a few examples earlier about involving users in the selection of our first cafe and, and our first chef, um, making sure that they were a part of the cook-off. Um, but we do involve users a lot um, in the workplace. So what actually happened in this environment is, you know, the economics of the situation meant that, you know, not a lot of uh, money was sent, spent on the build out, build out. But staff went out and got these flags to represent the, the many uh, cultures that, that um, were, were part of, of the, uh, the Google office and, and hung them up themselves. And the facilities team were like, sure, we'll help you out. Um, and we get to see here a little bit more about um, how users kind of uh, are at the desk because sometimes you look at the Google Photos and it's all people in cafeterias and, and, and informal collaborative spaces, but people do actually work. Uh, it is true. Um, so the, the basic setup is quite um, simple, uh, rectilinear desk, sometimes with the return, uh, a pedestal and a chair. Um, ergonomic tables and flexible um, uh, monitors which allow people to orientate things in the way that they um, need. 
Um, important aspect of our, of, of our philosophy around workplace is allowing uh, the, uh, our global uh, company to design locally to the context. So whether it be the, the business unit or, or the culture. So this is a photo that I took a couple weeks ago in Seoul, in the Seoul office. So this traditional meeting room on the floor that people can actually uh, uh, go to and, and engage in something they're used to. Uh, one of my favorite photos from one of our India offices, our uh, indoor cricket pitch, uh, cricket uh, cage. Um, so it's a, a constantly used uh, and, and once again very well separated from the desk areas, otherwise it would be four all the time as people whack uh, the cricket ball around. Um, and another huge part of our spaces is, is having fun. Now we don't just do this to kind of like have good photos like this that end up in magazines. Um, creating the fun environments um, are about creating that kind of wonder about the workspace. We at Google want people to come into the office uh, we want them to be working together. We've found that to, we don't, um, you know, have a, 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 a um, uh, we, we, ha uh, we have people working at home uh, as well, but we, we really encourage people to come in and, uh, and, and, and focus. And the reality is we've found that to be successful. You know, it's worked in the past, people together uh, working on solutions uh, and working on problems and finding solutions works. And we create these environments, these, these fun spaces in order to uh, attract people into those environments. You don't want to hit that ball too hard because it goes straight into the window. <laughs> um, context is, is important um, for our spaces and we'll kind of go through a couple of examples here. Uh, when, when we are planning out space for the future, um, it, it is important to design to the, the, the context of, of the building and make sure that you are uh, uh, meeting the requirements. So this is our Chelsea Market space in, in, in New York. And what we found there is 2007, we, we did this project. We found there is that the, the old Nabisco uh, uh, biscuit factory um, actually had a lot of characters, an old warehousey feel. So effectively what the architects had to do was very little. They let the character of the building actually come through and create the, the warm environment that's there. Um, also, it's important for us to design to the economics of the situation. Um, if we are growing very quickly in a certain office or a location, it's not necessarily going to make sense to spend a lot of money. So we look for, for cost-effective uh, solutions that make sense uh, for the time frame uh, involved. So in this office, you know, we wanted to add something fun, but you can see a lot of the decoration is on walls. It's things that Googlers have done themselves or some of our, our creative staff members have actually kind of uh, uh, graffitied on the walls. And the examples here, for example, this, this phone box was actually you know, purchased on eBay uh, through somebody's uh, credit card. So you know, low cost solutions, they don't have to be custom um, that uh, provide the environment. We also, um, if you look at our, our actual workspaces, we, we do tend to design pretty generically. So a simple module for the work point and the desk um, and, and a simple layout. Because what we want to do is, is not be too fussy about how we design. So if you look at how everything is laid out, it's not overly designed. Uh, we want to allow our users to, to create the environments that, um, that they want to be in. So this is uh, how staff in this office have actually decorated things themselves. So here's an example of, of um, at Google, you might be aware that we have these famous nap pods which allow people to rest and rejuvenate. Uh, this is another example from New York. So what we actually found is, is um, o overnight, um, a couple of Googlers had, had gone and, and placed, they recognized that the back of the nap pod actually looks like a famous uh, uh, um, a video game character. So um, they, they've added some, some, uh, some decals to the, the back of the nap pod to make it look like Pac-Man. So that's an example of, of something pretty wacky that we're already doing, but uh, Google is coming in and making it their own. And I'll hand back over to Ralph for the next section. Thanks, Hayden. All right, so we've, we've looked a lot about the Google experience and also some of the context. So the uh, two remaining principles uh, that are important that guide our space design uh, are really health and well-being and uh, then make it green. So for health and well-being, uh, let's look at some examples. <clears throat> uh, this is like actually uh, from the Zurich office, uh, one of these relaxation rooms that we uh, put in place. And uh, this is uh, probably, for, for my personal taste, one of the nicest ones we have. But I think the message that, that you should get is, you know, 
people just need these spaces. They don't always have to be super designed like this one. There's other places that allow people to get away and, and get them to relax. So, but having that is very important. We see that again in our surveys. It's actually one of the room types people request most is having more uh, relaxation and rejuvenation spaces. And if you look at it, it, it makes sense. I mean, if you work very hard, you know, you come to a point, if you don't take that break, uh, you're just not effective anymore. And uh, things like innovation and creativity don't strive when you're with your back against the wall and close to being burned out. You have to have these breaks. And that's why it's so important for us uh, to provide spaces like uh, this one. Uh, this is another nice one, actually. Uh, you may have heard that Google has a subsidized massage program. Uh, so Google is just uh, pay a little bit of money and can, uh, can have a massage. And uh, this is uh, actually interesting because this started uh, already very early uh, when the founders uh, thought it's good for people to, to relax and, and this idea of treat people well and they do good work. Massage was one of the first perks actually offered uh, after food, I think. Gyms get people to move and exercise. Obviously, if you look at, uh, at health, movement is important, but don't just think of uh, movement like you need a gym. Think of what can you do in a space to encourage people to move. And that's like what, what architects call uh, active design, you know, make spaces want you to move. Like this is an open staircase we have in one of our buildings and people actually use it. You know, we have uh, more of these like uh, almost scary staircases behind elevators uh, and nobody uses. But sometimes uh, people come up with some creative ideas. I just heard one of kind of people assigning points based on how many stairs uh, you walked. And that kind of motivates people to, to do it, right? So think about how you can encourage this with space, but think about also how you can encourage it with fun activities. Outdoor, the whole uh, idea of what's called biophilia, uh, having, having access to nature is, is something uh, where a lot of research has been done uh, not in the office environment, but in, in hospitals and other places. And it seems to have uh, a good effects uh, on people like healing quicker and things like that. Uh, and uh, so we're not conclusive on how good or, uh, or what exactly it does. If you look at our metrics, but we're researching that right now and investigating more as to uh, how big the impact really is of allowing people access to outside spaces, daylight and all these things. Healthy food, uh, also uh, very important. The micro kitchens serve as a space where a lot of that can happen. And uh, we present fruit very prominently. Uh, but we don't uh, decide for Googlers. We don't want to be paternalistic and say you can't eat a candy, <coughs> a candy bar or something like that. We try to have like this 80-20 rule, you know, where uh, what the heck, eat a candy bar if you want, but don't live off of it, right? So, uh, and our design supports it uh, in more subtle ways. We do have the candy bars. We don't put them like uh, nicely presented in the center of the micro kitchen, but if you want one, you can find one or two. <laughs> Daylight, I, I mentioned also uh, uh, very important. And as I uh, just said, we're doing research on that to figure out like what does it really do for people to their satisfaction in the building, to their health and well-being. Ergonomics, uh, very important. We have a lot of uh, sit-stand desks and uh, we have moving uh, walk stations. And actually, uh, we think we, we uh, found a breakthrough for uh, solving all our space issues. As you can see, if you arrange a sit desk with a stand desk in the right way, you actually can increase your density <laughs> dramatically. <coughs> we still need to see if the guy uh, below gets enough daylight, but uh, we'll, we'll figure that out. Okay, uh, the last point uh, we wanna talk about is sustainability. So this is like, make it green. Uh, the green team is doing uh, a lot of work uh, on various fronts. They work with uh, the uh, Green Building uh, Council. They're looking at uh, lead, leadership in energy environmental design guidelines. That's a good starting point if you haven't looked at uh, many of these things, where there's a lot of uh, guidelines on how to design green. Uh, and, uh, and recover energy and all of these things. And the green team is also uh, putting a lot of effort on making sure that everything we bring in the office is healthy, that there's no toxins in it. And I think uh, that they're really pushing the industry on that, uh, pushing manufacturers and suppliers to tell us what's in these products, uh, which is not always easy for them. Uh, but by somebody actually starting to ask, 
and we would encourage you actually to ask. I think if enough people ask, it becomes more of a standard and we can ensure that, that we do have healthy uh, products in our buildings. So make it green. Uh, just some quick examples, uh, living walls. Uh, this is making it very green, <laughs> uh, but it's a refuge space uh, where, where people can go and... Uh, we, we haven't found that guy, he's still... <laughs> yeah, he's lost in the jungle. Uh, but it, uh, interesting, again, we, more research to be done, but some research externally that was done shows it doesn't always have to be actually real nature, sometimes mimicking nature, using natural patterns or using posters or kind of faking it with these trees or, or the, the, the lawn already seems to show an effect. Again, we're looking into this more, but interesting. Uh, healthy materials, I mentioned. Uh, this hut was actually built from locally sourced and sustainably grown wood, and then it was treated with non-toxic materials. Uh, very important for us, and it, it really permeates uh, through all the things that we use in, in our buildings as much as possible. And sustainability, uh, a lot of effort on that. Uh, we had one of the largest uh, solar installations. I think it was the largest one back in 2007 uh, of any corporate, in any corporate environment. And, and we're still looking at a, a lot of different things like reclaiming water. And if you have questions on that, uh, Kasper is the right guy to actually ask and he can talk a lot more informed about it actually. So uh, putting it all together, this little video will give you, oops. Did we lose the connection? Roberts and Roberts oh. Advertising. Where is your father? That's crazy. crazy. Oh. Runs in the family. Isn't she beautiful? Oh, it's just this one. I'm leaving you. That's it? That's her. I feel like I'm back in court. Take half. The Crazy Ones premieres tonight. Adds to how we make our money. <laughs> what can we do? The number one thing in creating Google Workplaces is that we provide diversity. We create many, many different places for people to be as productive as possible. So one of the tricks is to design spaces with a diversity of scale, a diversity of light, mood, taking the typical corporate office and bringing it down to the human level of appreciation. That's the fun part, and it's really hard to do. And it looks like we're making it up and we're just kind of creating these crazy places, but they're very database, they're very scientific. There's information from Googlers that tell us what works and what doesn't work. What we've found is that you need a lot of diversity. Different workstations, formal conference rooms, to informal conference rooms, to big open areas, to other things like stretching areas, or gyms, or yoga, or micro kitchens. I don't think you can point to any one thing that creates innovation or creativity. It's the synthesis of the whole. It's the biophilic walls. It's the natural light. It's the density of the workplace, but the coziness of the places you can go to be productive. It starts with listening. And if you do that, if you're asked the right questions, they will feel ownership of that space. It's not my project. It's not the architect's project. It's their project. We're kind of like building little homes for our employees. I think that sums it up pretty well, actually. So if, if you look at what makes these spaces successful, if, if you really condense it down, I think it's uh, what, what Chris said, it's choice. You don't have people sit at their desk for eight hours anymore. Uh, people have to have the right choice of spaces that they can choose for the type of work they need to do. Uh, you want to involve your users. Uh, you want to be data-driven in your design decisions, and you just want to have fun. Uh, doing it and then I think uh, you will be successful and how exactly it translates uh, for you uh, Like I say, this was not a presentation to say this is how you should do it This is how we do it, but you might find a, a couple of bits and pieces Hopefully uh, that you can try in your own environment and that might work for your own culture I think that's important. You need to create something that that is authentic to you So with that uh, I think we'll end the presentation and we'll go to the Q&A Thank you Okay, do we want to bring other folks up on stage for that? Yes, please, Kasper and um, We actually have uh, quite a few questions already coming in online. Uh, those of you who are here in the room, if you want to ask questions, just please make sure to use the mic. Do you want to take I have a, uh, <laughs> and uh, we can use this handheld. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll MC these questions. Um, so while you guys are preparing here in the room with your uh, insightful questions, um, I'll take one from, from uh, our online Dory. 
Um, so the first one is, do you actually give employees money to spend directly on their workspace, or, do, uh, or are design decorations acquired by your team? Um, so I'll, I'll answer that one. Um, we don't uh, typically uh, provide, uh, the employees don't um, go out and we don't give them money um, in some other companies. A an idea that's sometimes used is giving a, a, a percentage of money to the employees, like say 5% uh, of, the, of the construction budget to buy furniture, and that, that can work out really well. Um, it, with, with workplace and real estate services at Google, we tend to provide uh, and fund um, all, of, all of the equipment. Now, the caveat to that is in some situations where an individual or a team decide they want something special for their group, then they, if, as long as their manager approves it, as long as it's not gonna be a fire uh, risk, we are fine with it. They can go out and, and use their own uh, company, uh, their own business unit's cost center, and go and buy something from uh, West Elm and, and add it to the office. Um, and what we're doing more and more is actually trying to make uh, recommendations for more sustainable furniture, um, more durable furniture as we move forward. So I'll take that first question. Um, does it make sense to segregate teams, marketing, sales, engineering, or is there a benefit to having everyone in the same space? I might direct that to Laura um, with your experience. Um, one of the best space planning mistakes I ever made was when we had engineers start in the New York office and the space that was vacant was right across from the recruiters. So I literally had recruiters and on the other side of the cue wall were engineers who were coding and that was a disaster. So I have engineers who can still come up to me and say, I still remember how to recruit for the sales position over here. Um, so with that anecdote to, as, a, as a caution and a warning and how you put people in your space, um, it's great to have people interact. I think that having like with like is a really um, good principle to go by, but then to have a common space, whether it's a micro kitchen or a cafe or a water cooler or the couch in the reception area where everyone kind of hangs out because it's comfortable, those are really great places for people who don't work on the same things to bump into each other and share ideas or problems or vent about a problem that they're having that someone else can solve. Another thing that we see work sometimes is co-locating people just let's say for a day a week uh, so to, to have enough interaction going on uh, and, and not break that concept that you had talked about uh, sometimes it's a good idea to have someone from HR sit with the people that they uh, support for a day a week, let's say, uh, especially if it makes sense for certain things that they're working on at given periods uh, of time, uh, and just look at it flexibly. Uh, so the next one is, when the company is growing, how do you balance a need for more space with the office being cavernous and mostly empty before you grow into the space? Um, so Casper, given you know, often that has an environmental impact, um, what do you think about that? I'm actually not sure if I'm the best person to answer this question. Um, I so think, I mean, I think uh, that New York may be a really good example of how you've you've been faced with that. I think in in Mountain View we have um, a bit of a suburban office park where we're able mm -hmm. to procure individual buildings as on an ad need basis rather than having a large space that's not full. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing you can also do is. Um, Actually, if you have a larger space, keep some of it dark, meaning you don't use it and you shut it off in a way that you actually save yourself the energy uh, to, to uh, fully run it, but you also avoid that uh, cavernous feeling that you're, that you're uh, describing there. I've seen companies do that. So I, I don't know, Laura, if you have ideas would be how do we typically do that. Yeah, I think... Um, still yeah. I think often creating a buzz is preferable to having a cavernous space. So I don't know experientially if anyone in the room has experienced the, the two. Um, our, in high growth years, we did pack people in, right? And the preference was let's keep people together closer so they can hear each other, see each other, and talk to each other rather than move into a big space presumptuously for economic reasons as well as for um, the environment. So how do you, uh, any questions from the room? Anyone want to jump up? You have to take the mic though, up the front so that people online can hear. All right, we'll get back to you guys. Uh, next question from Anonymous, um, a bit scary. Um, how do you keep noise down in an active sales environment? Um, so I'm happy, happy to take that. Um, 
noise in the open. So as, as uh, Ralph mentioned before, it's always a tension between uh, people actually getting some work done um, and focusing and the collaboration and the benefits from, from that. And it, it's the age old workplace uh, dilemma, enclosed versus open, noise versus quiet, which plagues every single company in the entire universe, private, non-private, profit, everything. Um, so how do we keep the noise out of an active sales environment? Um, we are figuring it out as, as we continue to, to grow. Um, what we uh, tend to find is successful is providing choice. So a lot of phone rooms for uh, salespeople to, to jump into. Um, uh, some teams, some sales teams uh, are fine with uh, all being on the call at the same time. They tend to monitor their own volume and, uh, and, and talk appropriately. What we found, there is some research to show that um, if you can actually, so if we're sitting across from each other at a desk, if there's a high partition and I can't see you, I actually speak at a louder volume because I'm not aware of how my, my voice is going to impact you. But if I can make eye contact with somebody who's uh, nearby by having a lower partition, I actually monitor my own behavior more. Most people do at least, not everybody. There's always that one guy. Um, and uh, so that's kind of like an interesting, uh, unexpected finding. If you actually see people, you monitor your own volume more. Um, so I think in a nutshell, it's about providing choice for people um, to be able to go to other spaces to make important calls. But it's also around the team uh, uh, monitoring their own behavior to make sure that they can support their, um, their sales efforts. Uh, fast growth, uh, cash strapped startups are usually cramped in their offices. Uh, if we can only set aside fun space for one thing, what would you recommend? Oh, that's a good one. I would say answer your people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, uh, again, the user uh, involved them. We do that today, you know, and we shuffle stuff around. I remember we had like a pool table uh, upstairs and people mostly use the ping pong table and now we have two ping pong tables and they get heavily used, you know. That's, that's a, a thing where I would say, see what people want. It's, that's an easy one, really. And a really simple practical note is pool tables take a lot of money to maintain because if the slate gets off, then it's no good. But ping pong is pretty cheap and you can fold it up or you can use it as a uh, conference room table. So I have to vote ping pong over pool. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you scale the space and design process as the business grows nationally and internationally? Um, Laura? I think it I think thoughtfully is the right answer because the thing that's really interesting as a small startup company you hope maybe that it becomes a really big company so what you're doing in your early days is you're setting precedent for how you do things and I think it's an important question to ask two two things actually two questions I would give you is number one is what I'm doing setting precedent and how is that setting precedent. And number two, am I creating something that will scale? So like anything else, you know, like that, that photo that looks great when it's two inches by two inches and you magnify it to poster size and suddenly it looks terrible, right? When you enlarge things or scale things, you expose where the holes are and where the things that aren't quite right actually show up. So when you're building, it is two questions I would say, am I setting precedent and how will this scale and grow? How that relates to space specifically, um, it's going to be dependent, I think, on your business. So there's a lot about, am I in a manufacturing business is very different than if I'm in a software business. So there are certain um, specifics you'll want to answer. Yeah, another thought on that is, is like practically availability of space. Uh, look, look at the different choices you have. I mean, building probably doesn't happen right in the beginning, right? Uh, so what are your lease options that you have? Uh, sometimes, I mean, we, we even, uh, not so distant past, used like a, a, a temporary structure like a tent uh, in Zurich as a cafe space because we couldn't uh, have the building completed uh, quick enough. So just look at it as a variety of, of portfolio options you have in real estate that you can choose from and have to play with. And then just make sure that your data are good enough to, uh, as good as they can be to try and predict where you're going. And we have a question from the floor. Hello. Um, you mentioned early on that uh, the company's culture um, is, it's important to have that sort of manifested in the environment that people are working in. Um, how 
influential um, is it for the company's leadership or founders' uh, own personal values to be included in that? And what does that kind of look like over a long span of time? Good question. Well, Casper? I feel like the majority of the work uh, that I'm doing and I'm focused on is actually really driven from the values of, the, of Google's leadership. Um, I feel like it's rare that there are companies who are out asking the question, how do I maximize user experience and health and well-being through my real estate? And so a lot of the work that we're doing on what I'll call IEQ or indoor environmental quality metrics, and that's things like acoustics, thermal comfort, lighting, both electric and natural, um, the biophilia element. Those are all things where we're really reaching out to the forefront of research and development that's been done outside groups and trying to figure out how does that, how does we take the data that's, that's out there, experiment with it in our Google offices, and then actually get data to substantiate whether it's working and we're um, getting the desired outcomes that we want. And I don't think that that would happen at Google unless the leadership was behind it all the way. And it seems like it's, I joined Google only a couple of years ago, but it seems like that was there in day one, and it's going to continue to be a, a driving force behind what we do. I'll add one thing. The um, image that you saw earlier of the wooden doors and the sawhorses, part of why that was one of Google's early desks is because sawhorses you can adjust up and down. So we actually, you know, not to a standing height necessarily, but I'm 5'1". If someone who's 6'4 sits at the same desk, I want to be able to adjust it for a comfortable height. And that was all surrounded um, by the principle of ergonomics. And that's something that's still really prevalent in our design culture, is how do you support someone who spends a lot of time coding at their desk? All right, next question. Um, when we talk about successful design versus, unsu versus unsuccessful uh, being data-driven, what data do you measure to evaluate whether it's successful or not? Ralph. Yeah, it's actually um, a, a lot of data at different layers. You know, we talked uh, and started with the business outcomes, productivity, things like that. Uh, it's not always easy to measure uh, and link uh, a very detailed uh, design-specific aspect, like what type uh, of flooring do you have, hard or soft, to, to productivity, right? So you go in steps and you look at uh, uh, things like uh, being able to do concentrated heads down work. Uh, that is an important uh, thing that you can link to productivity and then you look down and see what drives that and one of the biggest drivers for that is noise and then you go deeper and you see what's creating noise in the space and that's where you get to what type of flooring and you learn when you look at the data that uh, a nice looking concrete walkway uh, between desk areas uh, isn't the best because it uh, creates a lot of noise and a carpet or a soft uh, floor is better. So you kind of take the design elements of a building and link them to like noise, thermal comfort, uh, visual comfort. There's a, a whole bunch of them. Uh, and if you, if you look at like um, indoor environmental quality, uh, you see a whole lot of metrics that come up. And then we add our own ones where we look at what drives collaboration, like uh, number of interactions and things like that. So you don't always go and try to measure the very hard thing at the beginning. You break it down and then you work yourselves toward that. And it's easy to look and see if the floor is uh, hard or soft, and it's easy to ask somebody if they can do concentrated heads down work or if they have rapid information exchange. So break it down so that it works for you. Yeah, and this, this when I heard, listened to this question, I think it actually speaks a lot to the design process um, that we're currently implementing at Google. And really, the, there's a lot of data points along the way. You have to know a design target that you're trying to design to, you then have to verify what was actually built and whether or not that's what you really have. And then you have to bring in the data from the users and merge those all together, um, learn from it, and then you know, use that feedback to update your design targets so that you have a continual improvement loop. Yeah, and it's really a scientific process if you want. You know, you do create hypotheses and uh, define what are the drivers that I think impact something like thermal comfort. And then you do the analysis and you validate and based on that, you, uh, you uh, come to conclusions that may make you change your assumptions about design and you, you make things differently. That's why it's a uh, constant iteration and, uh, and the space is evolving. 
as well as data, we also have a very active uh, user feedback uh, system, which is basically just email and, and groups. <laughs> and um, man, people let us know when we're unsuccessful. Don't worry, the Googlers are very vocal when something's not right. And uh, thankfully, they're also very vocal when, when things go well as well. So that's kind of our, our more anecdotal, less scientific approach, um, is how involved people are and how much they care. They love the company, they love working here, so they really care about their physical environment. It feels like their home. Question from the field. Uh, um, so when Google was still young and space was more limited, uh, what kind of spaces did they have for rejuvenation? Question, Laura? The parking lot where they played roller hockey. Uh, it was really that simple and that creative. I mean, a lot of, a lot of it is, is using what you have. And um, there was this one area, I don't know if you noticed in the photo of the early TGIF, there was this one area where they didn't have cubes in the office. And that was where they had TGIF. They were like, oh, great, let's get these folding chairs. And someone found folding chairs online for like 265 each and like set them up and everyone sat down. Um, so I, I think Mountain View also had the opportunity to be in a suburban place where there's trees and, you know, kind of natural beauty. You can go outside and get a, a dose of sunshine. In New York City, we didn't have that as much. Um, you could go outside and outside and get sunshine, but um, the trees weren't there. So we found that people were um, gravitating towards a micro kitchen. Um, and it was very simple. It was Ikea furniture. It was a pain in the neck to build. I know, because um, I did it. But it was simple enough, it was comfortable enough that people came together and wanted to, um, I think, be inspired by each other. I think also like when you see some of those photos of, of the massage rooms and it's like a Zen garden with curtains, we, even our spaces now aren't, aren't even that fancy. You know, that's one, one example, but you know, it, it doesn't need to be um, a custom built solution to, to provide re rejuvenation or, or, or wellness area. For example, to say if you're a small company, you've only got 35 people, you're not going to have a massage room. But what could you do maybe once a month to get a, a chair massage uh, a, a company to come in? Just use one of the meeting rooms, just book it out, or even the open space. And that's an important point, is that we don't hide these things at Google. If you walk around our spaces, you'll see the nap pods right out in the corridor. You'll see people walking in and out of massage rooms. or, or any other. The idea is we kind of celebrate it. And like um, sometimes in, in, in North American culture, it's kind of seen as a bit weak or, or, or lame to nap during the day. But like at Google, it's like it's, it's seen as a strength. You know, like you have, you can go and rejuvenate. Um, we, we're really open and proud about that. We have hammocks in the open. We're not hiding these things. It's actually part of work is, is, is having some downtime, eating, sharing meals with people, and then coming back and working hard for 20 hours. <laughs> It's Which, actually, just, just to jump in on that, a very important point going back to look at your culture and what it is and make sure that your culture really supports it because you have a great idea. We, we to be honest, do see that at Google sometimes, right? That we do hear from some people, oh, I'm not comfortable uh, going to the gym, you know, what would my manager think? We don't see it much, you know, but we do see it here and there when we interview people and when we talk to people, and that's important to, to look at and to really make sure everyone sees what the culture should be and keep that alive. So um, be, be, be conscious of that in your, in your own environments and see what you can do to support it. And then I think a lot of it will happen by the creative creativity of the people there uh, to figure out what to do with that freedom and that culture that you, that you create. Question. How do you initiate that? How do you spark the okay to nap culture? I think, again, it starts from the top. Uh, it's, it's the values of the founders that, when we alluded to it early on, uh, came through with like having the cafe, um, having uh, like fun going out in the parking lot, you know, and uh, I believe, you, you might know, I believe even the massage service came in very early in Mountain View from, from what I have heard, and there was, I'm sure there was no massage room, it was probably more like what you said, Hayden, you know, but if, if as a founder you don't believe in it and you live it and you demonstrate it, then it's probably not going to happen, you know. Last one, he's exactly right, it's got to be from the top, from the leadership, who is either talking about it or exemplifying it. Yeah, and if, if you're not the leader, I mean, it, it's the sort of thing, 
uh, that you, you need to be aligned with them. And sometimes you can, you can sit down with leadership and you know, talk about things and make sure that they see things. They don't necessarily agree that um, your idea uh, to provide a service is, is, is um, going to work. You, you, you're going to need their buy-in, you're going to need their support in order to make success. But otherwise, you could end up with a bit of a, a, an issue. And I've certainly seen that at other companies. So and just, just one thing too, if, if you find yourself in that position to have to convince somebody, I mean, okay, I'm the analytics guy, so what do I say? I do say data, but data helps. And especially I see that in our culture with engineers, you know, sometimes they have a preconceived notion of what something should be and you can kind of uh, talk against the wall and nothing happens. But if you can bring some data that shows why you think what your solution is might be better than what they had in mind, they're actually very responsive, you know. They, and uh, so if, if that is what you need, there is good research that we base a lot of this on. And we alluded to that earlier. There's a good reason for a lot of these things that we do. And we believe it does impact productivity and creativity and idea generation. So there's a business need for that. It's not just a fancy nice to have. So we have time for two more questions. So if there's another one from the field, um, please uh, uh, stand up. Um, so the uh, next one we have is, uh, do you have a basic outline for minimum space expectation that you use? For example, 100 desks, uh, we need three bookable rooms, 10 conference rooms, uh, et cetera. Um, I'll, I'll take this one. Wow. Um, uh, do we have like a, a, a simple um, ratios of what works? Yeah, we do. Uh, we, we do. We're always learning and we're always uh, evolving it. And what we find is, is the situation and the context really drives that being different. So a sales environment in Tokyo is radically different from uh, an engineering environment in Oslo. So we, get, we need to, to, to play up the, some of the spaces and, and, and downplay some of the others. Um, we're getting better at, at being more uh, uh, data-driven behind this, and we're, we're, we're about to enter that phase where we have a lot more uh, uh, proof behind it. And, and to be honest, uh, in the past, it has been more anecdotal about kind of what worked and not worked about the ratios. Um, and once again, we, we do learn pretty quickly. We don't have enough conference rooms because the Google as well will be very vocal about that. And then often it's about... Um, uh, make sure you have enough rough ratios. One thing that we certainly have learned over time is to design to maximum capacity. And what we mean there is that d don't, uh, don't just put enough conference rooms for the 35 people that you have now. Um, if you know you're gonna be 50 people in, in six months, put enough conference rooms for 50 people and enough support for 50 people. Uh, it, it will certainly uh, behoove you and allow you to grow into that space where you have, if you have that a lever to play with, um, over, over design, make sure you, you build to the maximum capacity of that particular space and your inhabitants will be a lot happier. If I can add to that too, um Technology is changing so rapidly that 10 years ago you had to design and build a video conference room, but now you can do a video conference from your phone, right? So as technology changes, my best advice is don't design for technology, design for people. Great. And last question. I just wanted to add to the ask, continue on this a little bit. Sure. Thank you. Um, my curiosity is more along the lines of do you share that information? One, do you know ahead of time who you're building for always? Okay, so then you kind of need a template in order to be able to work that out. Mm -hmm. Do you ever share that with your ventures partners? Um, we, we, we don't share the, the ratios as kind of an, an internal thing. Um, and once again, it's really about trying to understand your, your own context and what works, works for you. It's a little hard when it's, when it's a new business, so I don't really have a, a, a pat answer for that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, it, it's, it's one of those things that we, we learn and develop over time. Um, but in a nutshell, it's, it's about variety of space and making sure that things are flexible. Um, so phone rooms, which are small two-person environments that people can get, get away to, small huddle rooms, which tend to be about four to five people, and then a variety of meeting spaces. And combined into that is, is um, informal collaborative areas, which often are incredibly useful for overflow. So if you have a, a cafeteria, or uh, sorry, a, a, a micro kitchen type of space or a kitchen, having a few open plan desks where people can come and have an informal meeting is great to allow people to collaborate quickly, but also when all the meeting rooms are booked, they can go to that space and use that kind of kitchen table type of environment to have the meeting when all the other spaces are booked as well. So um, yeah, ratios, fun times. <laughs> I'm just saying you guys have gone through a lot of work to get all the data together. Yeah. It's something a lot of the smaller groups don't have mm. able to pull together. And if you were ever 
to consider sharing that. I'm sure we'd all appreciate it. Yeah, I'm happy to talk to you after like about conference rooms. Is one of our yeah, yeah. Happy problems. to talk to you directly about your situation Thank afterwards. You and, and why don't we take one more question from the live stream? Because I know we sure. Uh, okay, here. last question. Uh, due to rapid growth, uh, we are in a small uh, three se three separate buildings within walking distance while we've been there. Uh, what advice do you have? Uh, for distributed teams and keeping the close feeling. So basically this uh, anonymous, again, three separate buildings, um, and that's a challenge, and we've certainly been there. First Laura? of all, congratulations. That's yeah. exciting. You're growing out of your space. Hayden did one of the best presentations um, in our New York office. Everyone was whining, we're still moving. We move all the time. You always move us. So Hayden pulled the statistics of how many people moved per each calendar month, and then he did um, a chart showing the stock price. And correlation does not determine causality. But Perfect. it was fascinating. So moving around and rapid growth is a really good thing that actually could be celebrated. And I would recommend doing that so that no one gets bummed about um, having to run to the meeting. But think about how you get physically in front of each other. And whether that's um, getting everyone together for beers and snacks on a Friday, or having a meal together, or bikes or scooters, um, keeping, keeping it easy and simple, uh, frictionless, to get from one to the other is really important. And then leverage you know, Google Hangouts, or video conference, or whatever, um, to stay in touch. Yeah, it's certainly a challenge that we have at Google as well as we grow uh, year over year and we're globally distributed. Um, we certainly do focus on getting the right people working together in the right, the same space. So that is a, that is a priority and that is something that we do. We have a, a come to work type of model. Um, and when people are distributed through need and through necessity, um, we do use, what Laura was saying, video conferences and thinking about how you know, we have a bowling alley in one of our spaces, and you might think that's a bit wacky and a bit opulent, but really it's about attracting people from different offices to, to go to other spaces and, and connecting. Um, so think about what you can do in each of your three spaces to attract um, people to the other spaces, or if you have one central space, what you can do to bring people in. Food's a great way, coffee's a great way. Um, we're, we are just people and animals at the end of the day, so we come together for food and um, and Beer often works in, in, in this area. So if you have Friday beers, people will turn up and be together. Great. Yes, uh, needing to move is a good problem to have. I think in my yeah. time at Google, I've moved 16 times or something like that. It's you about average. Average. You have well that done. nice little badge that you show us how many times we moved. And I, and I believe that I spent three years in one spot. So that'll give you some sense for how, how much we move. Um, thank you so much to Hayden and Ralph and the team. This was, this was amazing. I know we had more questions than we had time for. Um, so uh, if you're willing, I'd, I'd be happy to kind of pass some questions along offline by email, uh, email startuplab at googleventures.com, and, and I'll try to facilitate that. Um, and then any data that you, you're willing to share, I can, I can share that back as well. Um, thank you to everybody in the room, everybody in the live stream. This was terrific, and especially to you up here uh, for, for the, the great work. This was awesome. Thank you. Thanks.